I'm going to give you a uh, youth soccer's perspective, okay? And uh, a little bit, bit of it will be controversial, I'm sure, but that's what we're here for. So a three-year-old child is entered into a little kicker's program, or a little tight soccer program, or a pre-kinder soccer program, or the hundreds of other names attached to this phenomenon. Young, upwardly mobile adults see a game that actually may resemble soccer, and from that moment, many of their lives and their children's lives are permanently altered. There's no doubt in my mind that youth soccer has become an adult, money-driven sport that serves the needs of parents and rarely the children. I want to make it clear, I believe there's no parent intentionally leading their soccer playing children down the wrong path, but because of the immense social pressure attached to this upper middle income sport, parents are taking the complicated trail of youth soccer and ignoring the consequences attached. Many of the clubs in the Philadelphia area have professional coaches working with players as young as five years old. And in many cases, these coaches have little training in child development or even in soccer training methodology. There may be a recreation program in these clubs at the younger ages, but most parents had their eye on the prize, the exclusive travel teams. The never-ending drama begins for those children and their parents at tryouts. Imagine telling children at seven years of age they did not have the skills as determined by a few adults to make the team. These adults who rarely take into consideration the advantage of a child born early in the birth year that he has over a child born later in that year, and evaluators who cannot envision the future potential in any child. Incredibly, these same clubs cutting players at seven years old publicly display on their website their program is all about development. How in the world does development take place when a child is eliminated from competition at seven years old? The lucky, or in many cases, not so lucky players and their parents selected for travel are now placed into a cauldron that sometimes preys on fear of failure, the glamour of exclusivity, and irrational perspectives of what the right thing is to do. Travel teams are expected to have success in number of wins, but also in the rhetoric of most pay-to-play clubs, the development of players. The promise of taking kids to the next level is a familiar catchphrase for many elite clubs. From this moment on, as long as a child is part of the most professional travel club programs, their future takes a, pr a profound detour from other children, and in many cases, they may never see the most traveled route again. I'm sure all of you here tonight believe that the child should enjoy a sport that he or she plays. But how can a child be sure they enjoy that sport or another activity outside of sports if they have never been exposed to other sports or activities. Soccer has been very good to me, but the direction the sport is going begs for an explanation from the governing body of U.S. soccer, who only throws out random recommendations. The U.A. travel player with a professional coach now must train for two nights a week, initially, and play in a game or festival on the weekends at a cost of $1,500 a year. It seems relatively inexpensive until you take into consideration other cost factors associated with travel soccer, even at this young, yet young age, and the pressure placed by the parent on the parents by some clubs and their coaches. Think of the infomercials on late night TV, where the first offering of any product is delivered free except for shipping and handling. But lo and behold, the second delivery comes charged to your credit card, you use for the shipping and handling, and possibly more shipments down the road. Your calls are ignored and you finally succumb to the to paying all the deliveries. Many clubs may work in the same way. In addition to the initial cost for training, tournaments and travel expenses come into play. Clubs may provide training one or two nights at an additional cost. Mandatory camp attendance comes into play. Many tournaments within the club. And the biggest detriment to youth soccer, extra tournaments around the United States, in order for an individual club to gain points in order to move up in the rankings statewide, regionally, and nationally. From an outsider's perspective, it may seem illogical, but to a parent wanting only the best for their child and feeling a sense of competition with the other parents, having a vision of scholarships and possibly a professional soccer career, they buy into the whole program. What drives parents? One word, fear. Fear their child may not get the same opportunities of other players 
or a chance to be exposed to quality coaches and reap the final rewards. Author John O'Sullivan describes this phenomenon as the race to nowhere in youth sports. And he further goes on to say, it produces bitter athletes who get hurt, burn out, and quit sports altogether. This process may deliver a young child from a normal, intrinsically motivated childhood to one that is purely driven by a parent's ego or fear of their child being overlooked. Let me give you some personal examples of what is occurring at some clubs in the Philadelphia area. One of the largest clubs in Philadelphia actively pursues children at six or seven from local cubs, clubs, promising better coaching and a year-round training and playing because that is the only way to get to the next level. This rampant recruiting destroys smaller clubs and eventually the opportunity for children of a family with modest means to continue to play the sport. This club has four or five teams in each age group because parents buy into the promises. I'd had a chance to watch a UA team from this club train this past March. The training began at 6 p.m. under the lights. The temperature was 31 degrees with wind gusts up to 25 miles an hour. A few of the parents headed to their cars or to the warmth of the nearby indoor facility, but a few hardy parents dressed in Gore-Tex Antarctica outerwear, and no lie, one in snow goggles to stop the tearing, watched to make sure the session ran, session ran, ran smoothly. Incredibly, the coach who I know well was chastised in an email by a parent that there was not enough instruction going on during the shortened session. The coach told me all he wanted to do was keep them moving in order to eliminate frostbite. I personally trained a team of about 25 U8 players in my community in 2012. The purpose was to not cut players but provide all players the same quality of training. Great idea. Matches were played against other like-minded clubs usually in a 4v4 format, and for the most part, the teams were mixed in ability for any game. On a spring night, I noticed eight to 10 players missing from my training. I found out later the manager and a board member of the club decided to take the players, one who was his son, away from training because the top players as he saw them would benefit more from training without the weaker players hindering their progress. This was done at an additional cost to the parents. A local club within 15 minutes drive of this location has mandated that every travel club in their program must now play in 10 tournaments a year in order to accumulate GOT soccer points and move up in the ratings. Every time you go to a GOT soccer tournament, points are awarded in addition to the points your team receives based on performance in the tournament. You could have a mediocre team that moves up in rankings and the misinformed parents that will buy into the quality of this club based on their rank. So much for development. Let's remember that term fear. Parents, as we take this rational self-therapy journey to the road that is best for your child. So now your son or daughter is now playing U10 or U11 travel for a premier club. Training now is up to three days a week. Some training is now up to two hours a session. The coach has taken the position that success only comes if your child is totally committed to soccer, and he encouraged you to remove your son or daughter from the conflicts created by other sports. Training continues through winter at an indoor facility. Your son or daughter now plays in the futsal league. Tournaments are, tournaments are played in North Carolina to Florida from December to March at an additional expense. As the players get older, the commitment becomes larger, and in addition to other sports, all extracurricular activities at school begin to suffer, including music and the arts. School friendships become less strong or important, and your child's close friends become primarily members of the soccer team, some who live 50 miles away. Parents begin to realize that their circle of friends seems to be shrink shrinking as well, because weekends are spent at chain, re chain restaurants or hotel bars with other parents from your child's team. Your son or daughter begins 11th grade and there are a few letters from colleges and you search back to the promises of your club coach. Missing eight months because of a torn ACL due to overtraining and missing a series of college showcase matches in the spring because of a concussion may have hindered the opportunity to be recognized. You begin to question your decisions, but it's too late. A few offers come from Division I colleges and even a few provide modest scholarships, but these are not the schools you envisioned your child attending. Keep in mind that soccer is a non-revenue producing sport and coaches are forced to split what money they have available. 
As a former teacher in the Wallingford Swarthmore School District, I saw repeatedly parents questioning teachers, counselors, and administrators if they felt their child was not in the proper academic setting or not being challenged by teachers, and yet many parents rarely question the motives of coaches or the training methodology of the professional coach working with their child. Hold paid coaches to the same expectations and requirements you have of teachers in your schools. In an age where a club coach can make as much as a first, year, first to third year teacher by coaching two teams, parents rarely examine the coaching credentials, playing and coaching experience, or the coach's knowledge of periodization. Periodization refers to properly running progressive training sessions based on the number of practices per week and the number of games per week. Your son or daughter is playing at an elite level. Coaches must demonstrate a complete knowledge of periodization to keep their players free from injury and fit for competition. Plans change dramatically if training dates are altered or games move. In addition, periodization also encompasses weekly training loads and seasonal plans. Another area soccer coaches should realize and be concerned with is how the training load would change for individuals if they are attempting to play another sport or sports. Overuse injuries begin to occur and some injuries could be career ending if a, play, if a coach is unaware of periodization in their training and not aware of overload days, underload days, and recovery days within their team schedule. In addition, coaches must take into consideration substitutes who do not get the opportunity to play in a full match. Those players should be required to participate in overload training after match in order to maintain proper conditioning. Do you as parents realize that a full match demands 72 hours for full recovery and a 24-hour rule that any day following a match is a recovering day? This comes from U.S. soccer. Think about the most recent tournament you attended and the three to five matches you played in two and a half days. We examine the fear factor in parent decision making with their child, but there's an element of fear with the paid coach or coaching director within a club. Their fears include not maintaining a steady income, not bringing in more money to the club, and not winning tournaments and matches. These fears make for decisions that are sometimes unfair to players and parents. To tell a child that he or she must focus on one sport to meet success, or to search out better players eight or nine years old, rather than from, to develop from within it, is a product of these fears. It's going to take parents and players to stand up to those unfair demands of coaches and consistently tell them they, they want change. To think it is necessary to focus on one sport to be successful is a complete misconception. Many top flight athletes participate in other sports and achieve success. Taylor Twelman was drafted by the Kansas City Royals. Sergio Garcia was a soccer player before he started focusing on golf. Zlatan Ibrahimovic was strong enough in ta Taekwondo to be considered for the Olympics. Wayne Rooney and Roy Keane were both boxers. That's not surprising, though, if you know Roy Keane and Wayne Rooney. Theo Walcott ran track. Tobin Heath was a tennis player and a surfer. Mike Trout played football in high school. Uh, Abby Wambach, Stephanie Cox, and Heather O'Reilly played basketball. But the most impressive athlete playing more than one sport is Christy Rampone. She played lacrosse, basketball, and of course soccer in high school and in college, three sports. Um, in addition, she was a leading scorer in all three sports in her conference while in high school. The fact that she's still playing, she has two children, she's 39 years old, should make you think that maybe it's not such a bad idea to play three sports instead of focusing on one. This past weekend, the most exciting event of the year came to Philadelphia, the Penn Relays. And as, if, as, if, as if a gift to me in my presentation this evening, a true sign occurred. I was the head coach at Strathaven High School for 25 years and still have an allegiance to the school. In fact, I have a tattoo of a panther, the school mascot on my left shoulder. But this past Thursday, the Strathaven girls relay team broke a 17-year record for the 4x400 by running, running a time of 3, 3 minutes, 53 seconds in the Central League section of qualifications. But more importantly, they broke the county record for the 4x800 that same day, and they qualified for the Championships of America on Saturday in that race. This may seem insignificant, but three of the girls ran in both races on the same day, and better yet, all three played soccer. Allie Wilson was a Delaware County Soccer Player of the Year, Kristen Miller was the first team all Delaware County, and Jamie Kenny was second team all county, in addition to their success in track. 
When asked if they were happy about their decision to not focus on one sport, their answer was an emphatic, very happy. In addition, they also played basketball, lacrosse, volleyball, and swimming. When asked if any boy or girl between the ages of 10 and 12 should focus on one sport, they answered, it's too early to decide what sport really interests you. And it's too early to discover what sport you're really good at playing. Their advice to those young athletes, make sure you're enjoying the sport. If the pressure becomes too much, remember why you're playing in the first place and do what makes you happy. They also mentioned their fear of the strong Jamaican teams at the start of the 4 by 800 but they told me it's a memory they'll never forget. Let me conclude that I was also a parent who thought I knew it was best for my children and made soccer more important than it should have been. I and that coach, too, early on, was only focused on winning. I've used this story before with my parents in Olymp Olympic Development Program. I once asked my children, who are now all young adults, about their favorite soccer moment with me, expecting winning state championships, scoring a winning goal, or something of that nature. I was taken aback by the an their answer. They mentioned to me that there was a game uh, my daughter Kristen was playing, U12 or U13, and I took the other three kids with me. At the end of the game, you know, I, I did my usual rant in the car, expressing to Kristen, here's the mistake you made during the game. And they expressed to me they were really hungry. So um, I mentioned I forgot my wallet, so I thought this would be a drag driving home. But I, we were driving by some half million dollar homes in Bucks County, and they had an open house. So. In that open house, he also had three lunches, okay? <laughs> so I pulled in, and we went to the free lunch. We drove around looking at great, house, I mean, great houses in the golf cart, and that was their greatest soccer moment with their father, <laughs> okay? So here's what's gonna happen. I mean, right now, I realize for a lot of parents, your kids playing and the success they have is so vital, but you're not gonna be judged on the, your success as a parent based on your kid winning the U-12 Delco League. You're gonna be judged on how successful your children are when they're in their 20s and married and having their own families. And I think we lose that perspective when we're so enthralled with this whole idea of our kids being successful playing soccer.